I'd like for you to take your Bible, if you would, and turn to Isaiah, if you would. Isaiah. Chapter 53. As I said earlier, I woke up this morning uh, before the alarm clock went off. God woke me up and had me thinking about the cross. And I'd like to say that I wake up every morning thinking about God, but I don't. So I'm not going to boast on something that's not true. But this morning when I woke up, that was what was on my mind, was the gospel and the cross. And while I was laying in my bed... I was telling God, thank you for the cross, for Jesus' willful suffering to pay the unpayable debt for every man and every woman who wants that debt paid. We accumulated the debt by our sins, our lust of the flesh, and we have it. Our lust of the eyes, and our eyes are full of it. And even those who say they don't have a lust of the flesh and don't have a lust of the eyes, well, then you're guilty of pride because you think you're better than everybody else. That's a sin as well. It's a sin to think that you don't do any sin. That's a sin. And so all of us are guilty, and I'm guilty. And what I deserved was to be beaten... I deserved to be stoned. I deserved to be killed, executed. And I deserved to be thrown in the prison called hell. I deserved to be judged as unrighteous and unholy and a breaker of God's law. And I deserved punishment in the lake of fire for all of eternity. That's what I deserved. There are people all over the world who are going to stand before God in judgment and God is going to say to them, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. And by no good deed of my own, my greatest hope is that God would say of me, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. See, while I find it next to impossible, in fact, if not impossible, to live a good life, for me, it is easy to believe what God said and to trust that Jesus alone is our Savior and that God's mercy endures forever. Somebody say amen. Isaiah 53. This was written about somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 years before Jesus ever died on the cross. It was prophesied of exactly what was going to take place on that day. And there's other prophecies. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 starts out with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, those were the exact words that Jesus said on the cross. Now, some might say, well, he knew that, so he said it, and that he did it, he self-fulfilled. But it also says in Psalm 22 that they would pierce his hands and feet, that they would wound, they would strip him of his clothes, they would wound him, and they would mock him. Those exact things, a thousand years later, were done to Jesus, and he had no control over that. That was the Roman soldiers that did that. So your Bible, when it says something's going to happen, it's going to happen that way. Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So my message to you this morning is many fold. But one of the messages that I want to get across to you today is who will believe the report? I'm here to report to you. What was done for you? And God is seeking in this world people who will simply 
believe it. People who believe it. Who believes in ghosts? Who believes in Bigfoot? Who believes in UFOs? Who believes there are bad people in the world? Who will believe that Jesus died for their sins? Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus did not look like some great, beautiful prince that everybody thought, oh man, he's wonderful just to look at. He did not look that way. He is despised and rejected of men, including some of you sitting here today. Some of you sitting here today will reject him and have already. What a shame. When all he tried to do was love you and pay the, pay the debt without you owing him anything at all. All he did was try to pay your debt. You'll reject him. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. With every blow that they gave to Jesus with that scourge, with, with every strike, and the pain that Jesus went through, with each one of those, when that scourge was laid upon His back, with each one of them, it pleased God to do that. And Jesus willingly took that scourging for you. The analogy would be if you have a brother or sister and your brother or sister went out and did something stupid and mom and dad found out about it and they were going to take your sibling and beat them severely for what they did. And yet you stepped in and said, Mom, Dad, I know what my brother's done is wrong. But he's weak. And he just, this is who he is, this is what he does. And, and I feel sorry for him. So, Mom and Dad, will you let me take his beating for him? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never done that for my sister. But I would now. Both of them. But that's what was done. With every blow that they inflicted on Jesus, He willingly took it. Didn't have to. But He did it. Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. Healed of what? Sin. You're healed of sin. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. In fact, everybody say that with me out loud. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's a lot of sin. That is a lot of wickedness to be laid upon one man. The sin of the entire world laid on one man. But he did it willingly. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought, look at here, as a lamb to the slaughter. Now I want you to think about the words of your Bible. Not a sheep and not a goat. In fact, look up here on the screen. In the Passover, the Jews were required to take not a goat and not a sheep. Not an adult goat or sheep. They were required to take a lamb of the first year. In other words, one year old or less. Look how cute that is. Kitty cats are cute. Little kitty cats. Little puppy dogs. Even little piglets. And little lambs. They're, they're adorable. They're cute. And they're innocent. And they're white. You know what that means? They're pure. And a lamb has done nothing wrong. And God required that a lamb be the substitute instead of us. So he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. In fact, if you look at little, go online and look at little pictures of little lambs of the first year. And it looks like every one of them is smiling. It's not Photoshop either. That's just how they look like dolphins. They have this just little smile on their face, little grin, little cute, little innocent lambs who have done nothing wrong. He was taken from prison and from judgment. That happened, by the way, that exact thing happened. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That exact thing happened. A wealthy man allowed Jesus to be buried in his tomb. A thousand years. A thousand years before it ever happened. God said it would happen. Made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord. Look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why did it please God to do this? Why did it please God to take, in the Old Testament, an innocent, white, cute lamb... And slaughter that lamb, spilling his blood everywhere. Why did that please God? Why did it please God to take Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, not the sheep, not the goat, not the adult, the innocent white lamb that had done nothing wrong. Why did it please God to slaughter him? Because it justified the demands of the law. The law that God sent down to this earth from heaven required that each and every one of us who broke God's laws, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. And those are just the laws in respect to us dealing with other people. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Then... On top of that, before God says all that, God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in 
vein and every body that I'm looking at today has done exactly those things. So the law, God's law required that the sentence of death be upon you. In some cases, they were to take you and scourge you 40 times. My mother never whipped me 40 times with 40 lashes. She never did that. So I can't imagine being given 40 lashes as punishment. I can't imagine being cast out in the street and people taking large stones and pelting me with those stones until I died. But that was the punishment that Jesus took from me. And he put it on himself. And why did he do that? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put, he hath, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his own soul. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. That exact thing happened. Because he was hung on a cross on Golgotha. And on each side of him was a murderous thief. One... Two, three crosses on Golgotha's hill. That was the number for transgressions. And Christ did exactly that. And it was told a thousand years before it ever happened. Therefore I, will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, let's go to the prayer. I'm going to start the message. But I'm going to move through some of this. You know me. I always put in more scripture because I always think I'm going to run out of things to say. I, mean, I always think I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough Bible to give you. But I'm going to give you some Bible today. Because you need it. I need it. And I'm pretty emotional today because I have a friend who's never forsaken me. I have a friend who's never let me down. I have a friend who's never done me wrong. He's the best friend I have. And I feel it an honor to stand and represent my friend to you today. Father in heaven, I love these people. I love them enough to tell them the truth. I ask you, God, that you, as you guide me through the scriptures this morning, that what I say to them, I say in love. I know some of the people here and I know their life. I know, Lord, some of the things that they've done. And I love them. And I do not stand in judgment over anybody today. I stand as Jesus does. Condemning no one. Offering forgiveness to everyone. And Father, I pray to your God that you would bless those who take advantage of that offering today. Bless and honor your word. As I teach us, Lord, about the lamb that was slain. Thank you, God, for giving us the Lamb, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, up on the screen, in Exodus 12, Israel, this is a picture of you. You're in bondage. You're in bondage to sin. Sin rules over you, and you cannot stop. Who remembers those days? Raise your hand. You could not stop doing what you're doing. It had such control over you that your sin dictated to you every thought, and every action. You try to hide it, 
You try to deny it. You try to act like it's not there. And then you try to pretend like it's not a big deal and it's okay with God. But it's not okay with God. And you're in bondage. Now, here's what I've learned. Some people still like being in bondage. I don't understand that. Because God has put it in us to never want to be locked up somewhere. We don't even like MRIs. Because it's constricting and we don't like it. But some people just... They don't know anything but bondage. And they've given up on ever being out of bondage. That's the worst sin in the world is to lose hope. Because God can make anybody free. So here's Israel and God is going to set them free. But here's how he's going to do it. He said in Exodus 12, 11, Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now why did God have them all standing up? Because when he said, I'm going to set you free, I'm going to set you free. So I want you to act like you want to be free. I want you on your feet with your walking staff in hand, your stuff on your back, eat it in haste because you're leaving. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So God said, if you really want to be free, I want you to act like you want to be free. I want you to act like you're ready to walk out the door at any moment and be set free. Prisoners, guys who are in prison right now, who have a release date coming, I guarantee you, they count down the days to the day that they're going to get out of prison. And on the night before they're going to be let out, I guarantee you, nobody sleeps. They don't sleep. They get their stuff on, they put their suit on, their shoes on, get their stuff, whatever they're allowed to take out, they're going home that day. And God's people ought to be ready to be set free. Amen. But he said, it's the Lord's Passover. What does he mean by that? For I will pass through the land. Notice the word pass here. This is God's Passover. But I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And look at this. When I see the blood, I will what? Pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now God meant that to set the Israelites free. But I guarantee you if you're an Israelite and you don't do what God said, you're not standing up eating the lamb, you don't have the blood on your doorpost, you're acting like you don't want to go and you're acting like you don't believe it. You're going to lose somebody out of your house that night. In fact, if you're the firstborn, you're dead. Because while you think that God will just get over your sin, He won't except He sees the blood. And if He sees the blood, He will pass over you in judgment and you're free. But if He doesn't see the blood, you're dead. God said every household, even Pharaoh, lost his first born son. The Bible says that there wasn't a single house in all of that land where somebody didn't die that night. The slaughter was great because not only did the firstborn of every family die, but the firstborn cow, goat, chicken, sheep, the firstborn of everything they had died where it was standing that night. So in Exodus 12, God said, I want you to draw out and take your lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian. When he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. Watch this, watch this. The lintel is what's over the head. The side post is on either side. So watch this. They took the blood and they went. You see what it did? It made a cross. Right there on the door. And God says, if you'll get behind the cross, I'll save you. If you'll hide behind the blood, I'll make you free. 
but be standing up and act like you want to be free. The Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into his house. Verse 27, that you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. You see, God's not just interested in saving one of you. God wants to save all of you. Your whole house. Your whole family. God said, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. And the symbolism of that is white is purity. The lamb of the first year, he's adorable, he's loved. He has a smile on his face. And he's completely innocent. And yet, the one who has done nothing must bear the punishment of those who have done everything. That's the symbolism of it. Turn to Revelation 5. Turn to Revelation 5. Here's the Lamb. Here's the atoning, suffering, slain Lamb. Revelation 5. Boy, I should have put this in my notes. Revelation 1. See if I can find it. Yeah, there it is. I'm going to prove to you this Bible's right. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Notice that's capital L. A lamb as it had been slain. Jesus is the lamb who was slain, but now he lives and the lamb stands at the right hand of God being given the book of God, the authority of God. And so it is Jesus who is here today in this room, in your Bible, Jesus is here today in this room. Because not only is he the lamb, he is the word of God. And he has seven horns and seven eyes. And you think that's weird. But those seven horns are the seven spirits of God. And he will bring that to you. And he'll give that to you willingly. So look at verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song. Look at what they sung. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Look at here. For thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and every tongue and every people and every nation. So it doesn't matter if you're white, black, brown, red, yellow. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. What background you have, what nation you're from, what race you are, what language you speak, doesn't matter what you've done, the Lamb can qualify you to live it with God in heaven for eternity. Now, He's the Lamb, is He not? Look at Revelation chapter 1, open your Bible. I'm not going to put it on the screen because I don't have it in my notes. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to show you He, he literally is. The Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. They represent God's people. Because Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I'm telling you, Jesus is in this house today. Who believes that? Say amen. He is in this house. And he's talking to you right now. He's talking to you. 
And he's telling you, I know what you did. I know your sins. I know your eyes are full of lust. I know what your flesh has done. And I know that so far you've despised me. But I'm here today to tell you that I love you. And I will forgive you of everything you've done. I put myself on the cross willingly for your sins. Not mine. For yours. And I give it to you freely. And you don't even have to join a church. Because if I save you, I make you an automatic member. And don't worry about what you think you might do after you're saved. Because I've already got that worked out. And I want, this is me talking. Everybody in this room who claims to be saved and are Christians, they're not perfect. You know they've done things wrong. You've seen them do it. But they're forgiven. Maybe not by people down here, but they're forgiven by the one who counts. Now look at verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. What does his hair look like? Wool. What do little lambs have on them? He literally is the lamb. You see, there's a reason why his hair is white like wool, white as snow. Because Isaiah 1 says, Come down, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And in the law, the priest, once a year, would take all the sins, like, he would like do this. Just kind of pretend here. And he'd take all the sins... And he would take a, 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 a goat and he would put his hands on the head of that goat and discharge the sins of Israel for one year on the head of that goat and then cast out that goat. He was called the scapegoat. You ever heard that phrase? You ever known somebody that's been a scapegoat? Somebody that's had to go down for somebody else? That was Jesus. And all the sins on his head were red. And they were, see that crown of thorns on Jesus' head? When you take thorns and mash them into somebody's head, what color does their hair turn? Jesus then took the sins by way of the thorns and he took them to God. And God then took the sins and made them white as snow. That's why when John sees Jesus now, his hair is not red anymore. It's white like wool, white as snow. That's what God did for you. And so Jesus is here today talking to you. Not condemning you. Not yet. Today, he's offering forgiveness. Tomorrow, he may have to change and bring condemnation. But today, he's offering forgiveness. He paid the debt. He took the suffering. He bore the shame. I mean, think about it. They literally tore his clothes off and hung him naked. I know there are no paintings that depict that. But the Bible says they stripped him naked. Why? Because when we're naked, we're ashamed. And we cover up our nakedness. Do we not? I mean, I'm thanking God that all of you came to church clothed. But it's in our nature to cover up our own nakedness. And they stripped Jesus bare... And they hung him on that cross to bear your shame. So you don't have to be ashamed anymore. 
I have a lot of regrets. And a lot of shame. But I know that I have been forgiven. And so can you. So would you bow your head? Think about that lamb. Think about that Passover lamb. And see that lamb... is standing before God now. And He's going to tell God one of two things about you. He's either going to say to His Father, Father, they have called upon Me and I have blotted out their transgressions with My own blood and they are white as snow. Or, Jesus is going to have to say, Father, I offered, and they refused. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. It's your choice which way you go. The debt's been paid. The offering has been made. The innocent has now suffered and been your scapegoat. If you'll call upon Him and believe, you can be made free. I'm going to offer you a few minutes to ask the question, do I want to be saved now? Do I want to be saved now? I guarantee you somebody is in this room praying for you. I guarantee it. And you're fighting. I know the fight. I've done it. So has everybody else here. Fought God and lost. And they're glad they did. But today I'm going to offer you the moment to ask the question, do I want to be saved today? So I'm going to make it as easy as I can. I'm going to give you the opportunity to come down here to one of these benches. And I'll come and pray with you. And I'll show you from the Bible that you call upon the name of the Lord and God will forgive all your sins. You can be clean. You can leave, you can leave this building clean today. Or, I'm going to stick around. And you come find me and say, Mike. I'm fighting it, been fighting it all my life, and I can't fight it no more. Will you show me how to be saved? I'll do it. So I'm going to make it as easy as possible. But I can't do it for you. You got to want it yourself. Father, I come before you today and I ask you, God, to work in hearts. I can't do it. My words mean nothing. If the Holy Spirit does not move in anybody's heart in this room today, who am I? God, you know every heart. You know the condition of that heart. You alone have the right to judge them. Nobody else does. And Father, you and you alone can bring a sinner to the point where they want grace and salvation. You and you alone can make that happen. So Father, my prayer is that to anybody here or online, 
that you're ready to move them from sinner to saint. That God, you would do so right now. Father, bring sinners to repentance. Bring backsliders, Lord, back to where they need to be. Forgive somebody's sins today, Father, is all I ask. Father, I love you, and I thank you for saving me. For having mercy on me, and for long-suffering with me. And God, if you can save me, you can save anybody. And Father, I've seen you take the worst person that I've ever known and make them a saint, and they're in heaven right now. And so, Father, I ask God that you save somebody today. Do it for your kingdom's sake, your mercy's sake. Do it for them. Do it, Father, to answer the prayer of someone who's been praying for them all this time. But God, save them. Those of us, Father, that are saved, we, Father, we glorify you and we thank you, God, because we would not be here without you. And Lord, we admit before this group that we have a long way to go. And we are not perfect. And Father, we thank you, God, for always forgiving us. For always having mercy. For always loving us enough to chastise us like a father would chasten his son. Because that's how we know you love us. Father, we ask for your mercy and your grace today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?